Okay, so lab four is now posted. Lab four. Oh, wait a minute. This is the old version. I'll have to find the new version. Um, I'll post the new version. It, regardless, it doesn't really matter. It's This is last year's. I'm going to make it similar, um, but I'm going to change a couple things. Um, so just to, what I, what I want to go over today doesn't actually impact this lab that much uh, because there's two things that I want to be, you to be able to do. So um, first, let me pull something up here. Oh, look, I probably have the new one on my thing, and I just put the old one up. I don't know. I have to look. Um, let me see. So what I want you to be able to do is come up with a spreadsheet to do beam design. So we're basically done with our column design stuff. So next Monday, we're going to start with beam design and start talking about beam design. We'll talk more about beam design on Wednesday a little bit. A little bit. We're going to do some review art. Don't worry. Um, but we'll do, we're, we're going to keep moving with beam design. So eventually, what you're going to get to is um, creating something. Oops, that's the one I wanted. Um, something that looks like, I think, was this the one that we had brought up? I don't remember. Um, Yeah, I brought this up earlier in the semester. I made this, or I showed you this earlier in the semester. We did some different beams and figured out the weight per ton and that sort of thing. Okay, I'm going to delete this. Um, but basically, what we're doing is we're looking at um, mo moment design for beams. So, what does this curve remind you of? This looks like a buckling curve, right? So, guess what? Beams can buckle. Does, does that make any sense that a beam can buckle? Where does it? Where does it? Why does a column buckle? A column buckles because you put it in compression. A beam is a member that essentially we define kind of sort of as it, it has a it has to resist a pretty significant moment, which means part of the beam is in compression, and part of the beam is in tension. A moment is, you know, where you go from the neutral axis, the top of the neutral axis typically is compression, the bottom is tension for positive internal bending, right? So what happens is, um, and I think, I don't know if I brought this up the last time or not, but um, lateral original buckling beam. I think I showed you this, this video at some point, right? Did I not show this video to you? Did I show this video to you? I showed you one of these videos, but here we have a beam and they load it at third points. And what happens? Well, as they load it, oh, come on. Okay, there you go. You can see the top, which is an impression, is starting to buckle. You see that? So that's lateral torsional buckling. So the failure mode for this beam is not a material failure so much as it is a geometric failure. So since there's so much compression in the top flange of this thing, the top flange wants to buckle. Can you see it? I mean, you can see, in, in, even if you're looking at this on the screen, I don't know if you can see it up here, but right where my mouse is, you can see the bottom flange is sort of staying straight. What's that? Is it being loaded like this? It's there. This is this is the elevation view. It's being pulled down. This is the top view. It's you can see the top is buckling out. This is the side view. You can see the top is buckling to the right. Does that make sense? So these these loads are pulling down on the beam. You can see deflection is almost a little bit, you know, curvatures in this direction. You see that? Okay, so. Um, what I want you to do, though, is to basically come up with a spreadsheet that will calculate this curve here. Maybe. 
and then you know then what we can do is we can say well what happens if we have a hundred foot kip moment and a zero foot unbraced length we can click a button and select a size that will resist that moment this is actually the smallest size that will resist that moment so in addition for example let's if we increase the moment to 200 kip feet Right now, that point's no longer any good. We can click the button, and it'll optimize the design to come up with a W16 by 31. Or we go to 250, and then again, we can optimize the design. 300. Eh, I don't like 300. Let's go to 225. I want to get back to that W18 by 35. That was one of the beams we used because that's a pretty optimum beam for a lot of a lot of cases. Okay. And then we can start looking at well, in in this video here, you'll notice that this top, um, this top, the, the the beam is not actually braced except at this point and this point. You see these these blue like beams sticking up here? Those are causing. You can see them in the um, the side view a little bit better. Those are bracing the beam from buckling. So the unbraced length for this beam is you know from this point all the way to this point. You see that? So if we change the unbraced length of the beam, so if we go up, let's say to 10 feet, what happens? Well, our point over here on the curve no longer is at zero feet for unbraced length, it goes to 10 feet, which is no good if you're looking at the, the VMN calculated straight for lateral torsional buckling. And then we'll talk about CB, which is a, a factor you could throw in for lateral torsional buckling as well. So we'll talk about CB. But CB gets you. CB essentially basically gets you uh, the blue curve. So the the yellow curve here is the straight buckling. Um, CB is what the code allows you to do to modify um, to modify it, to modify it. So this is no good if you use a CB of. Or I'm sorry, it's, it is okay if you use a CB of 1.67. It's no good if you use uh, it without that. And actually, I think I said that wrong. Um, so the this is the this is the um, CB equal one curve, and this is the CB equals 1.67 curve. And it was like 1.25. You'll see that this curve is a lot closer to uh, the shape of this curve. It's, it is a piecewise function. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to basically build off of what you did the last time. So there's a whole mess of section properties here, and these section properties are all just look up. I mean, if you look at this, these are all just look up from um, from the original one. Okay, and then um, in addition to that, uh, what you have to do is like this. I mean, that's just an input cell. So all these are input cells here. Uh, this is an input cell. You have to calculate VMN. You have to calculate the unity value. We'll talk about unity in a minute. Um, some of these values you can look up, some of them you have to calculate. Uh, and then for the graph, what I did is I, I made some points here and just calculated, um, well, I figured out what the unbraced length was and VMN. So this, this chart here is just the unbraced length versus VMN. Okay, so we haven't gone over beam design yet, and I recognize that. Um, but what I wanted to do today with this lab is I wanted to assign it and get you into, into all sorts of fun stuff. So I wanted to get you into, um, into the coding for this, this sheet. So basically what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how to build a macro in Visual Basic. Anybody take a Visual Basic class? Anybody ever do any coding ever? Good. Well, we'll learn, all right? We'll learn you. So that's, I'm going to start with an example that's similar to this, but not exactly the same. Uh, so you'll get to adapt it a little bit. So I'm sure I'll save that. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to pull up something else. So I'm going to pull up a lab lookup sample that I did. And if it's the right. Oh no, that's the wrong one, I'm sorry. 
so here we go. Uh, that was the lookup sample. Um, this is a this is a Visual Basic sample. Okay, so what what I put here is this is a sample um, a sample a spreadsheet that I want to kind of walk through to show you how to do that macro. Okay, so um, you'll notice in Excel if you have a macro, uh, there's a security warning, so you do have to enable the content. Um, you, I would make this a trusted file if you're working on it, and then you know what coding is in it, so it hopefully should be safe. But basically what I did here is I made a spreadsheet and I said, uh, what I want to do is I want to find the smallest y flange section for a given load to achieve the yield stress. So in other words, if we have an axial force of 1,500 kips, what area do we need to have, you know, sigma equals P over A equal to 50? Does that make sense? So our axial stress formula, anybody ever use the equation editor? So sigma equals P over A. Remember this formula from like statics? Or not static, strength of materials. Remember the formula? Okay, so this is um, this is what we're saying. Well, if we know P and we know sigma and we know A, like what size shape is the smallest that will get us that shape? So if I had a 100 kip force here, okay, I could, I could optimize this. Let's go to 200 just to make it a little bit more challenging. Um, so I go to 200 kips. Uh, I, how much area do we need to get 50 KSI? Well, we need four square inches to get 50 KSI. You see that? So 200 over four, force over area, equals 50 KSI. So we need four square inches. So I need the first wide flange section that has more area than four square inches of steel. Does that make sense? So what I'm gonna do here is I already came in and I already took all the wide flange sections from the, um, from the what do you call it, from the, the shapes database. So I took all these wide flange sections, and I took them, and I sorted them based on the area. You know how to sort? So you come over here, you take all your stuff, you can do a sort, smallest, largest. Okay, so I sorted them. Basically, this is based on area. So as we go down, the area is always increasing. So logically, what would you want to do if you were doing this? What, lo logically, what you would do is you take this and say, okay, I need four square inches of steel. So I'm going to come into here and I'm going to start looking down my list until I hit four square inches of steel. Once I hit there, I'm going to stop. I'm going to go to the left. I'm going to get my sections 12 by 14. Make sense? But isn't it so much nicer when we can just plug a number in and click a button and let the calculator do it for us or the, the spreadsheet do it for us? Maybe kind of, sort of. It looks cooler to your boss. I'm just saying. Click a button. There's the, there's your result. I don't know. Maybe it doesn't. I actually used Visual Basic quite a bit and built a spreadsheet that was probably worth tens of thousands of dollars. Just in time. Just in time I spent working on it. And in save time. So what we had to do is we had to analyze, a, I think I mentioned this at one point, but a dam that was like a mile long. And there were like multiple sections of this dam. So what we did is we built a spreadsheet and we built one equation or one spreadsheet to analyze any section of the dam. Then we built a database that had all the sections of the dam and all the geometric properties. And the spreadsheet, all it did is it cycled through each section and did the analysis for each section based on the varying geometric properties. Because the analysis was the same once you figured out what the, the different geometric properties were. And the reason we did it that way was so that we could make tweaks to different parameters and see the impact. We wanted to do a stability analysis because they were faced with looking at, um, well, this was this was previously the hundred-year storm or the PFM or PF, you know, po possible PMF, the pops, possible maximum flood, right? So they, they had one possible maximum flood PMF value, and they were looking at having to design the dam for a new PMF, which was higher. Well, now the question is, well, how much higher is it going to be? How much is that going to impact your stability? And how much, you know, are you going to, is it going to cost to, uh, to revitalize the dam or, you know, fix the dam, retrofit the dam? So we created the spreadsheet that analyzed the dam first, and then we could start looking at parameters. Well, 
you know, how sensitive is the analysis to different parameters? What if we choose a different assumption? How does that make it? So we could really quickly run through the analysis rather than having to open 50 different spreadsheets and go through and make changes on 50 spreadsheets. We could make the change in one place and reanalyze it based on geometric data. So we ran a loop that basically went through each of the things, each of the, each of the things and, and looked at the, you know, the analysis for each one and spit out some results. So here this is similar, but it's, it's like a half an hour version. Okay, um, this can be super powerful, but what, what we want to do here and what we want to do is we want to tell the computer basically to start here and to keep going until it finds the right thing and then stop, right? So manually what we could do is we could say, okay, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to come up to the top. I'm going to start with 6.8.5. Nope, it doesn't work. Not enough steel. Okay, I'm going to go to the next one. Nope, doesn't work. Not enough steel. Go to the next one. Nope. Next one. All right, so we can do this manually and it's just kind of annoying. Or we can tell the computer to do it and it'll do it. Um, you'll notice down here I have a unity value. What do you think unity is? Unity, all unity is, is it takes the area of the selected member and divides it by the minimum area that we need. So here for 1500 kips, we, have, we need 30 square inches of steel. If I optimize this, the W27 by 102 has exactly 30 inches of steel. So we get a unity of one. So what does that mean? That means that's a perfect design. Your demand matches your capacity. Does that make sense? Typically, you want unity values less than one. Why is less than one good? That means you have extra capacity, more capacity than uh, demand. So the denominator is bigger than the numerator. So the demand is less than the capacity. Does that make sense? So you need unity less than one is good. Um, if it's over one, what does that mean? It means that you're overstressed. So like this is 4% over, potentially overstressed. Does that make sense? Kind of, sort of. So I can use this unity for a number of reasons. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to press Alt F11. So I'll write that down. Alt plus F11 gets you to the VBA screen. Okay, so Alt F11, and um, when you get there, you're going to have something that looks kind of like this. This is your VBA screen, your Visual Basic screen, and typically you won't have Module 1 here, so we'll have to add Module 1. So I'm going to, or what I can do here is I can click on this sheet and I could insert a module. So typically you'll need to do that. So I right clicked, insert the module, or you can have the insert and insert module. So this inserts a macro. Um, so with a macro, what you need to do is you need to do a couple things. And give me two seconds here. Um, so. So I worked this out um, previously, so I'm going to start it again. So what, what we did here is um, with a macro, typically you have to have, the first thing you have to do is you have to identify what the name of it is. So to do that in Visual Basic, use sub. Sub is, is the way you start it. And I'm just going to call this macro like optimize, because that's what we want to do is we want to we optimize the function. And you'll notice when I hit enter, um, it gives me end sub, because Visual Basic recognizes that this is the subroutine that you need to run and basically this is a, a subroutine that will run and what will happen when it runs absolutely nothing because nothing is between sub and end sub so anything you want the, the macro to do you need to put between sub and end sub does that make sense so you start with sub put your parentheses parentheses and then you end sub and there's other ways of doing it um, anytime if you want to insert like comments you can use a single quote and you can put like a comment like this is a function to optimize the size of a, I don't know, the, or to find the optimal member size. You know, you could, you could say something, and when you hit enter, you'll notice that turns to green. Can I make this bigger? I can't zoom in. I'm sorry. I wish I could. Um, but if you want to put any comments, use a, you know, um, I'll just put comments use a single quote. This is just for your benefit. Okay, you don't need to write that in. So then the other thing that you need to do is you need to tell typically um, Visual Basic, you want to tell them or tell Visual Basic what 
what values you're going to use and establish them. And then you want to tell Visual Basic whether it's a text value, whether it's um, a number value with integer, like an integer number value, or it's a decimal value. So well, one of the things that I'm going to do here is I'm going to say dim. I'm going to call this unity. And then I'm going to say as. And you'll notice as I put as, some of these things come up. Um, but what I'm going to type in here is double. A double um, is basically a decimal. So basically what this is doing is it's creating a placeholder for the unity uh, function that we're going to use, or I'm sorry, unity variable that we're going to use, and it's, it's telling it that the double means it's going to be a decimal. Um, in addition, I'm going to do dim, I'm going to call this selection as string. What do you think string is? String is just text. So this is the, going to be the beam selection or, you know, shape. Let's call it shape. Why not? Shape as string. Okay. So we're going to we're going to pick a shape and we're going to keep going through and we're going to go from there. So right now this macro doesn't reference your worksheet at all. It's just it's in your worksheet but it doesn't really reference your worksheet. So what we want to do is we want to do something where um, this will reference the worksheet that you're working on. So um, you'll maybe you noticed, maybe you didn't. Um, what I did here was in this spreadsheet I called this calcs, I called this sorted. So the sorted list versus the calcs page. Okay, so I named these sheets. You can leave them sheet one and sheet two. It doesn't matter to me. But this is this is going to get referenced in Visual Basic. So when we come into Visual Basic, we're going to do, we're going to look at sheets. And then you have to put in quotes, calcs, and then parentheses dot range. And then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do um, shape equals w 6 by 8.5. Okay, so what I'm saying here is um, first I want to come to the sheet calcs, then I want to go to the range in that sheet called shape, and I want to define that value as w 6 by 8.5. Why do I want to do that? So let's look here for a second. So if I click on, uh, I think I, let's call this shape. And then if I come over here and type in shape, let me go to um, my name manager, get rid of selection for a second. Okay, so this is called shape here, if you can see that. Um, so what I'm saying is I want to start this with a W6 by 8.5, so I'm going to go to the first one. So all I did in, in my macro for now is I said, I'm going to define, so if, if, if I ran this macro, all it would do at this point is it would define sheets calcs, the range shape as a W6 by 8.5. Does that make sense? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to run it and see if that actually happens. So it did. It got to a 6 by 8.5, but nothing else happened. So what do we need to do next? So what we need to do next is we also need to define a unity value. So our unity value is going to equal, and the unity here is this is inside the function now, is going to equal, and we're going to use the same format. format. We're going to say, um, we're going to use sheets.calcs uh, range, and we'll call this unity. Okay? So what this is doing is it's assigning unity inside the, the function or the, or the subroutine as the unity value that's from the sheet. Does that make sense? So if we come back to the sheet, I already went through and named this unity. So you'll see that's named unity. So the unity value, it's taking this unity value and it's assigning it to um, to something. So if we run this, nothing's going to happen, but now the function knows that unity is 1.587. Okay? And then what do we want to do? Well then what I'm going to say is, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to come back to I'm going to come back to my routine here, and I say, well, what I really want to do is I want to go through each of these. I'm going to go through one, two, 283 of them, and I want to find, I want to start at one, and I want to go all the way down until I hit something that works. So to do that, I'm going to use a for loop. You know what a for loop is? Okay, a for loop goes for, I'm just going to define some variable like i or j equals one, two, how many? 
283, right? So I'm going to go from 1 to 283. Oops, I need to put spaces in there. But that's the nice thing about Visual Basic. If you screw something up, they'll typically tell you. Um, so for i equals 1 to 283, what do I want to do? Uh, what's the logical test that I'm gonna that's, I'm gonna check? Tab over. I did tab over. I just so yeah, I tabbed over just because a lot of times if I do like a loop or something, I'll wanna leave some space just so that it's easier to to see kind of where things are. Okay. It's it's nothing. It doesn't it doesn't change the code at all. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, well, well, what are we doing logically here? Logically, we're saying, well, if this is less than Actually, what we're really doing is we're saying, well, if this is less than one, then we're good. If it's greater than one, or if it's less than or equal to one, we're good. If it's greater than one, we need to go to the next shape, right? So if the unity value is greater than one, we need to go to the next shape. Does that make sense? And we'll keep doing that until the unity value is either equal to one or less than one. So how do we do that? Well, in an if statement, what we're or not for for a for statement, what we're going to do is now we're going to write an if statement. So if unity is greater than one, then we're telling it what to do. So we already defined unity up here. We, we said we're going to use unity as 1.587 or whatever. If it's greater than one, then what do we want to do? We want to switch to the next one, right? So what we're going to do here is we're going to take this sheet and um, we have to change it now. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, um, if it's greater than one, then what we're going to do is we're going to define that cell as the next cell in the list. So we, we want to define the shape cell as, as the next shape. So how do we get to the next shape? Um, what I'll do here is I'll say, well, we want to do sheets sorted. So we want to go to that sorted list. And here I'm going to use a cells, a cells call. So I'm going to call the cell. And what I'm going to do here is, so essentially what we're doing here is we're saying, well, we're starting with, you know, the cell here of, what is this? This is essentially 2 comma 2. Do you see that? The row column format. So oh, it's row two, it's column two. Well, if we go to the next one, what's it going to be? It's going to be row three, column two. Row four, column two. Row five, column two. Row six, column two. Do you see that? So if i equals one, what's the row going to be? The row is going to be i plus one. Does that make sense? Maybe, maybe not. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say i plus one, comma two. that gets me to the next value based on whatever i is. Okay? And then we have to redefine our unity. So unity is, once this gets updated, now we have to redefine unity in the program. And then, um, then we have to tell it to end the if statement. So typically when you write an if statement, we start with if then. What's after what's after then? What if what if um, greater than one doesn't hold? And we say else. And this is where the tabs I think help, Jay. I'm just gonna put these in here. Um, so we have an if then and then we have an else. Else what do we do? else, right, so yeah, so now we want to say um, if unity is less than or equal, well, actually we don't even have to do this. If it's not greater than one, it's going to be less than or equal to one. So what do we want to do? If it's less than or equal to one, what do we want to do? What's that? No, now we just want to stop. So, so if it's if it, if unity is not greater than one, I mean it's going to mean it's less than or equal to one. So basically, all we're going to do here is we're going to say um, we're going to exit the for statement. Oops.
Oops, I shouldn't have ended my F. I should have, um, I should have ended my F down here. I'm sorry. And then we end the F. Okay, so we have a if then, else, and then end if. And if if all else, so basically if, if it's greater than one, we go to the next value, we assign unity, and we also have to tell it to do the next I. And that's it. Let's see if it works. That's it. How many lines of code is that? 21 lines, but let's see how many actual lines. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 14 lines of code. I think you guys can do it. Okay. So what happens here now if I come back to my calcs? Now I click optimize and it finds the right one. <coughs> So how to get this button in here? It's another good question. I'm just going to delete this out, um, and I'll show you how. So to put a button in, all I'm going to do is I'm going to take this. I'm going to insert a shape. Um, actually, I have to go to home. Or is it home or insert? Oh, here's a shape. So you can use a star if you're really excited. Um, you can use whatever you want for your button. But um, what's that? You could probably put a picture in. Sure, you could do all sorts of things. As long as the picture is appropriate. You, smile for me real quick? <laughs> you weren't fast enough. So if you right click on this, you can edit text. That's great. Um, so you can make a shape, you can add text to it, and then you can also right click and say assign macro. So now we have one macro. You'll notice we call this optimize. I'm going to click OK. And then if I click on it, it optimizes the shape. So if I type in 1500, it'll optimize it. So while this isn't exactly like what you're um, doing for the beam, it's very, very similar. Because basically, you're going to take that same function, and you're still looking at a unity value. You're still going to step through shapes. But now instead of, uh, instead of calculating your unity value based on sigma, you're going to calculate your unity value based on um, VM on U. Does that make sense? So, if, actually, MU over VMN because um, MU is the demand divided by the capacity. So, you want the demand to be less than the capacity, unity less than one. All right. So, the only difference in what you're doing when you take this and put it in your um, in your beam formula is is you know is how you calculate unity. It's still going to step through all the shapes. It's still going to do all that. Okay. So you guys may not appreciate this, but this is something that is actually sort of useful. I used it a handful of times when I was in the real world and Visual Basic that is in like basic for loops, basic if statements, uh, basic coding like this in a spreadsheet can end up saving you time. Maybe you don't think so, but this is a half an hour example that honestly I went through it super slowly, sort of, and didn't make many mistakes here. So if you watch the thing in the next hour, you could basically build this. If you want me to look at it and make sure it works? I mean, feel free. But um, this is the first part of your spreadsheet. I mean, you're going to do the lookup thing like we did the last time. This is kind of taking spreadsheets one step farther. Same. And then, and then we'll get into um, we'll get into the beam stuff and the bending stuff where you can basically calculate VMN. That's the next step. So once you get this, then you have to go calculate VMN. And once you calculate VMN, that's the rest of the spreadsheet, really. I mean, it's just like, calculating VMN is the hardest part of the spreadsheet. OK? And then you have to create a graph and that sort of thing. So that gets a little challenging, too. But um, what I would say is I'll, I'll um, 